say you can't have too much of a good thing. While that may not be the case with horror, given that many of the greatest scary movies ever made are on the longer side, such as Rosemary's Baby or The Shining, it's still nice to throw on a film every now and then that you don't have to carve out a three-hour time slot for. Of course, laying groundwork is an essential part of any frightening tale, but sometimes brevity is key when it comes to horror filmmaking. So if you don't feel like buckling in for a two-and-a-half-hour slow burn, I'm looking at you, Ari Aster, but still want your fix of fright, look no further. I'm Jess for What Culture, and these are the best horror movies under 90 minutes. Zombieland. 2009's Zombieland packs a lot of shotgun blasting, gift shop smashing, Twinkie eating undead action into its relatively short 88 minute runtime. By the time 2009 came around, zombie movies were dying a slow death, until Zombieland crashed onto the scene and gave the genre the bolt of lightning it needed to reanimate its bloody corpse. Due to its fiendishly clever meta script and four memorable performances from Woody Harrelson, Jesse Eisenberg, Emma Stone, and Abigail Breslin, Zombieland was an immensely fun fun and concise romp through post-apocalyptic America, and has since become a beloved entry into the zombie canon. So if you like your zombie apocalypses with a satiric bite and a quick moving pace wrapped up in a tight hour and 28 minutes, Zombieland is for you. Creep. Nothing gets the nerves jangling quite like 2014's delightfully succinct Chiller Creep, which stars Mark Duplass as a disturbed man who hires an unsuspecting documentarian to help him film a mysterious project in his secluded woodland home. The film gets increasingly unsettling over the course of its 82-minute run, due in large part to a career-best performance from Duplass, who terrifies as the enigmatic Joseph. The movie is most effective during the scenes in which Joseph and Aaron, the cameraman, are simply con Conversing, ramping up tension as Joseph reveals more of himself to Aaron and toys with him by maintaining intense eye contact and testing his personal boundaries. The film builds and maintains suspense expertly all the way to its hair-raising climax, which will stay with you far longer than the movie's shortness would suggest. Trick or Treat Few movies capture the spirit and atmosphere of the Halloween season like Trick or Treat. Writer-director Michael Doherty's passion project follows an anthology of four stories that take place concurrently during one fateful All Hallows Eve. The common thread that links all four tales of terror is the presence of Sam, a mysterious trick-or-treater wearing orange onesie pajamas and a burlap sack over his head, who sometimes acts as a passive observer, other times a functional element of the chaos. The overall conceit of the film is that Sam appears whenever a member of the small town in which the movie is set breaks Halloween tradition and doles out a savage punishment. The deceptively well thought out script pays loving tribute to Halloween lore and heritage of all kinds, both old and modern, through a series of deliciously diabolical chronicles all tightly woven into its brilliantly brief 82 minute time span. Don't breathe. Don't Breathe follows three down-on-their-luck teenagers who decide to break into an old blind veteran's house and steal $300,000 in cash he's alleged to have just lying around. Despite the sense of necessity and desperation we get from the protagonists, their scheme to burglarize a disabled senior citizen is morally dubious at best, and oh boy do they get their comeuppance. Director Fede Alvarez, fresh off his well-received Evil Dead remake, turns the well-trodden home invasion genre on its head by making the intruders the protagonists protagonists, who must face off against Stephen Lang's visually impaired villain, who goes to extreme lengths to defend his home. Its fleeting length of 89 minutes perfectly suits a film of this kind, as it's just long enough to serve the story, but not so long as to undermine the ever-building tension. With a few well-earned twists and turns scattered throughout, Don't Breathe is a fun-sized horror that's definitely worth your time. Hush. Speaking of home invasion horror, 2016's Netflix original Hush is almost the exact inverse of Don't Breathe, in that it concerns a deaf woman, Maddie, played by Kate Siegel, who must fight off a masked assailant attempting to break into her secluded house. Despite her significant disadvantage, Maddie continuously outsmarts the intruder, even going so far as to write a goodbye message to her family in which she includes a physical description of the killer so he can be brought to justice should she die, which is a refreshing change of pace for a movie of this genre. Given its simple premise, it makes sense that Hush only lasts for a mere 82 minutes, but the nifty pacing and assured direction result in a short and sweet modern slasher. With established horror talent like Mike Flanagan and Siegel of Haunting of Hill House fame, behind the camera you can expect this pleasantly compact thriller to be a skillfully constructed horror gem. Sleepaway Camp 
Ah, summer camp, such fond memories. New friends, experiencing nature, adult male counselors wearing uncomfortably revealing shorts, and of course, a string of brutal murders. Thanks to its endearingly amateur acting and a truly kooky script, beginning with one of the most bonkers dedications of any movie, Sleepaway Camp ranks high in the annals of 80s slasher movies. The film chronicles a pair of cousins, Richie and Angela, who arrive at a sleepaway summer camp where Angela is instantly subjected to cruel bullying because of her refusal to speak. Soon though, Angela's wrongdoers start to get picked off in increasingly horrific ways. That hair straightener scene? Ugh. Sure, it's cheesy and hammy and just downright weird on occasion, but by virtue of some inventive kills, entertainingly hackneyed performances, and its notorious twist ending, it stands out from its contemporaries as a truly daring, unconventional, and endlessly fun slasher thrill ride that'll have you in and out in a fleeting 85 minutes. Paranormal Activity Oren Pelly's found footage Fright Fest was made for a scant 15 grand, only to go on and earn a whopping 193 million in the box office due to sensational word of mouth, making it one of the most profitable movies ever made in terms of return on investment. The supernatural smash hit details the lives of a married couple who become convinced their house is haunted and decide to set up cameras all around their home to document the strange ongoings. Unlike similar films in the genre, Paranormal Activity makes the echo economical choice to not show any demonic spirits on camera until the final frames, instead electing to create an almost unbearable tension using only its lead actors and minimal effects all the way through its 86 minutes. By making genius use of its shoestring budget and limited sets, Paranormal Activity is a paragon for doing a lot with very little. The Evil Dead the Evil Dead was a formative film in shaping the horny teens do something stupid and accidentally unleash untold evil upon themselves trope. This 1981 splatterfest stars Bruce Campbell as horror icon Ash Williams, who must face off against the demonic spirits that have inhabited his college friends in the secluded cabin where they plan to spend their weekend getaway. The evil entities are released as a result of a tape recorder containing ancient incantations, which Ash and his buddies find in the cabin's basement and subsequently play. The the movie incorporates hints of tongue-in-cheek humor and slapstick violence, which eventually get elevated to the point of full-on parody in the sequel, and has since become a trademark of the series. It's an efficient monster flick that wastes no time in getting to the point and delivering the gory goods all within the space of a rapid 85 minutes. What We Do in the Shadows one of my personal favorites, this comedic mockumentary takes a peek into the lives of four vampire roommates who share a flat in suburban New Zealand. From the minds of New Zealand superstars Jermaine Clement and Taika Waititi, this sucker punch horror comedy proves that there is still some blood to be drained from the veins of the vampire subgenre. The film follows in the tradition of darkly funny New Zealand horror movies like Brain Dead and Bad Taste, and provides a unique comedic take on the modern world, as the four centuries old bloodsuckers wind up befriending a meek computer analyst who unwillingly becomes their object of affection. It's a truly weird take on the vampire story, but at a nice 86 minutes, What We Do in the Shadows is a ton of fun and an excellent choice if you want your quick fix of outlandish scares. Halloween. If you're looking for some classic horror, then be sure to check out John Carpenter's seminal slasher, Halloween. Clocking in at a clean 90 minutes, this 1978 fable of fright set the standard for suspense. Its deceitfully simple story follows masked serial killer Michael Myers as he escapes from the psychiatric facility where he was kept since childhood after murdering his teenage sister at age six. You're then along for the ride of his ensuing exploits as he stalks sunny teenager Laurie Strode and her friends. The film cements and even invented some of the tropes that slasher movies are now known for, such as the sex-obsessed teens that are slain one by one, the psychotic killer in a mask, and the virginal final girl that remains the sole survivor of the massacre. Halloween also launched the careers of John Carpenter and Jamie Lee Curtis. After becoming a surprise hit in 78, Halloween became the movie that defined terror for a whole generation, all packed into a sleek hour and a half. Lights out! In 2013, David F. Sandberg released a spooky short called lights out. Despite being under three minutes, it was scarier than almost any movie released that year. Due to the short's positive reception, Sandberg was given funding to adapt lights out into a feature. The film centers around a mentally ill woman called Sophie, who discovers she and her children are being pursued by a spirit who can only be seen in shadow. 
Although the effects in the short were very simple, this was due to budgetary concerns. Because this feature had a lot more money behind it, it would have been easy for Sandberg to rely on CGI for the supernatural sequences. Fortunately, the esteemed filmmaker focused more on practical effects and authentic lighting to make the paranormal scenes more convincing. What makes Lights Out scarier than the traditional horror film is how it highlights the drama with the family more than the metaphysical. If we saw a ghost every five minutes, we would be desensitized to it. Because Lights Out emphasizes Sophie's struggle with her mental instability, you get invested in her plight, which makes it far more unexpected when her family is suddenly attacked by a killer ghost. Critters Critters opens with a group of aliens called Krites crash landing on Earth. When a kid called Brad Brown finds the extraterrestrials in his home, he does everything he can to protect his family. Even though Critters looks pretty dumb, it has a lot of positive qualities. It has a surprisingly good cast, including a pre-fame Billy Zane. Also, Scott Grimes, who's best known for playing Gordon on the Orville, is solid as the lead character. Although the titular furballs are built up from the opening scene, the movie takes its time showing them, which makes their introduction more suspenseful. Unlike most movie aliens, these monstrous creatures are surprisingly distinguished. They have a creative look, a unique attack, and showcase a range of different personalities. Because critters are small, furry, vicious, um, critters, many assumed this horror comedy was a ripoff of Gremlins, which only came out two years prior. Rest assured, Critters isn't a copy of anything. Without spoiling anything, this cult classic is way weirder than you can possibly imagine. If you're looking for a horror that's a little bit zany, Critters is definitely for you. Child's Play Over the years, Child's Play has spawned a ton of sequels, a remake and a TV series. Also, Chucky's cameo in Ready Player One was absolutely hilarious. Because most of these entries have ranged from underwhelming to borderline unwatchable, it's easy to forget how good the original actually is. Despite the fact the franchise leans into tongue-in-cheek territory upon every entry, Child's Play is a straightforward horror. There's not that many campy moments and the one-liners are kept to a minimum. Although Brad Dourif kills it as Chucky in every film, he's never been more entertaining or terrifying than in the one that started it all. Would you believe Arrested Development's Jessica Walter was originally cast? No, seriously. Even though jump scares are regarded as lazy, they are highly effective in Child's Play since you genuinely believe Chucky has popped his clogs two or three times. Just when you think it's all over, the gingerhead doll springs back to life. If you're not a major fan of Chucky, you should still give Child's Play a watch. It may not be perfect, but it's inarguably the best of the franchise. Rabid David Cronenberg's Rabid opens with Rose getting into a motorcycle accident, forcing her to undergo an experimental surgical procedure to survive. At first, the operation appears to be successful, but after Rose develops a craving for human flesh, she begins biting passers-by, turning them into rabid flesh eaters. Also, she infects people with a stinger that stems from an orifice under her armpit. After all, this wouldn't be a Cronenberg feature if there wasn't some weird body horror in it. What differentiates Rabid from traditional zombie flicks is the fact that the infected in this film are alive and still have their personality intact while they gorge on human flesh. In a way, this makes the story more disturbing, since Rose is aware of the evil she's committing but is unable to stop herself. Although Rabid is gory, it's the way society reacts to the virus that leaves you feeling disgusted. As the epidemic grows out of control, government officials start shooting potential spreaders, making the elite appear less humane than the infected. It may have received a mixed reception upon its release, but Rabbit has aged surprisingly well and is way better than the 2019 remake. Eel or Them As far as premises go, Eel couldn't be simpler. One night, a school teacher named Clementine is woken up in the night when she hears music outside. When she and her husband head out to investigate, they find their car has been stolen. When they return home, they discover their electricity has been cut so they can't tell the police. To make matters worse, Clementine notices a group of hooded figures following her. Because so many modern horrors highlight showy effects and excessive gore, it's nice to see a haunting thriller focus entirely on ramping up the tension. Once the scares start, they don't let up until the credits roll. Because of this, watching Eel isn't just scary, it's exhausting, but in a good way. In the hands of an inexperienced director, watching our leads scurrying around in the dark for over an hour could have been boring. But due to effective camera work, eerie soundtrack and creepy sound effects, you can't help be gripped by David Moreau and Xavier Palud's movie. 
The Beyond. The Beyond centers around a woman called Liza who's preparing to renovate a hotel she's recently inherited. The refurbishment is a lot harder than Liza assumed since sections of the building are dilapidated and infested with spiders. Oh, and the hotel is built on a gateway to hell. That also poses a bit of an issue. The Beyond may have been panned upon its release, but it's now regarded as Lucio Fulci's finest work. The unearthly score and the disorienting cinematography keeps you constantly on edge, even when nothing particularly scary is happening. The practical effects for the gore is as creative as Evil Dead. If you have a fear of tarantulas, it's possible the scene with the man-eating arachnids will give you a heart attack. Rather than introducing the supernatural elements gradually, things get freaky almost immediately after Liza arrives at the hotel. Even though the Beyond is filled to the brim with ghosts, creepy crawlies and zombie wizards, Fulci's work is a gothic horror rather than a conventional spook fest, since it focuses more on atmosphere and suspense, leaving viewers in a permanent state of dread. Terrified Terrified is a supernatural horror from Argentina which revolves around a paranormal expert called Walter. After seeing a ghost in his own house, Walter teams up with a group of researchers to investigate the paranormal phenomena that's plaguing the neighborhood. As frightening as Terrified is, it's more disturbing when the film goes against the grain. After a boy is killed, his corpse rises from his grave and shambles back to his house. Instead of streaming or attacking civilians, the child sits at his dinner table motionlessly for an agonizing six minutes. Because you have to stare at this decomposing child for the entire scene, you can't help feeling uncomfortable. Another trope that Terrified avoided is the character in denial. Because the evidence for the supernatural is overwhelming, pretty much everyone accepts the area is haunted. If you're sick and tired of movie characters disbelieving everything the hero says, you'll be relieved to hear Terrified doesn't bother with that cliché. Terrified also proves that timing and sound effects are more efficient tools at evoking real fear than shock gore. If you don't leap out of your seat at least once at Terrified's out-of-nowhere jump scares, then you must have nerves of steel. Sauna. Now before you ask, yes, Sauna is a film that centers around a haunted sauna, and no, it's not a parody. As laughable as this premise sounds, this Finnish flick is a must-watch for horror fanatics. Taking place at the end of the Russo-Swedish War, two brothers are tasked with marking the area, which is now under Swedish rule. On their travels, they discover a sauna in the middle of a swamp. Guilty of the lives they took in battle, the siblings agree to use the sauna, believing it will wash away their sins. Shortly after entering it, they discover that it is occupied by a spectre, who's eager to remind them of the evil they committed. Like The Lighthouse and Donnie Darko, Sauna explains very little, leaving many scenes up to interpretation. Due to the non-linear structure, some viewers might struggle to follow the story. But because the plot is told in such a haphazardous manner, you can never tell what's going to happen next, so you're never ready when things go nuts. If you enjoy films that don't spell everything out for you, Sauna will be right up your alley. Eyes Without a Face In Eyes Without a Face, a girl called Christine is left disfigured after a car accident, forcing her father, a surgeon, to find a new face for her by any means necessary. Despite being regarded as a horror classic, Eyes Without a Face has no scares for the first 30 minutes. It spends so much time detailing Christine's dilemma, you could initially mistake the film as a drama. But when the horror kicks in, it comes in full swing with a grotesque face transplant scene. Because the director had a firm knowledge of slaughterhouses and made a documentary about the subject, he used his own experience to ensure gory scenes such as this one looked grisly but authentic. Although the father falls into the mad scientist archetype, he never comes across as a caricature. Due to Pierre Brasseur's subdued performance, you can't help feeling sorry for him, even though his means to remedy his daughter's condition are abominable. Because of Christine's unbearable predicament, you can't really blame her for allowing her father to perform his horrific experiments. However, it's only in the movie's final moments when we learn whether she's willing to embrace or condemn her father's methods. A Quiet Place In A Quiet Place, the Abbott family are forced to live in silence after the world is decimated by aliens with hypersensitive hearing. Because of the premise, it's no surprise that the majority of the movie has minimal dialogue. Even though a movie without sound could come across as gimmicky, A Quiet Place is the best kind of horror. Beautiful, inventive, touching and downright terrifying. Never in the history of cinema has the sound of a footstep filled you with so much dread. It's impossible to relax while watching, even when it looks like the Abbots aren't in danger. While the family are playing board games and relaxing at home, you are always aware the slightest noise will result in their immediate demise. Although the best horrors can falter in the third act, the climax of A Quiet Place is an emotional roller coaster that's sure to leave you reeling. 
Wreck. This 2007 found footage horror film, Wreck, remains one of the genre's finest efforts to date, a dizzying, frequently nerve-shredding Spanish horror in which a news reporter, Angela, ends up trapped inside an apartment complex with a group of firefighters whilst a viral infection spreads. At just 78 minutes in length, Wreck is the perfect example of a horror movie that gets to the point quickly and doesn't let up all the way to the finish line. There's not one ounce of fat on this thing, which is powered by both a fast, unspooling mystery and expertly executed suspense set pieces, culminating in one of the most gut-wrenching finales to any horror movie of the last 15 years. It is terror-concentrated down to its most efficient form, and its direct sequel isn't actually that bad either. Now, you probably needn't bother with the English-language remake Quarantine, though, which is a basic shot-for-shot -shot retelling, but 11 minutes longer and somehow less good. Carnival of Souls Cult classic 1962 horror Carnival of Souls, the sole feature film of director Herc Harvey, follows a young woman Mary whose life begins to unravel after surviving a car accident. Though its central narrative conceit might seem relatively obvious to modern eyes, Harvey's film is a masterclass of atmospheric design, especially for its era and its low $33,000 budget, and most obviously influenced George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead a few years later. Candace Hillegos is terrific as the put-upon Mary, a woman becoming increasingly overpowered by haunting visions and, in particular, the allure of an abandoned carnival. Inside a drum-tight 78 minutes, Harvey crafts an intensely moody horror that remains a vaunted favourite amongst genre aficionados six whole decades later, and for damn good reason, host. The earlier stages of the pandemic were certainly a test of horror filmmakers' creativity, and budding director Rob Savage put himself on the map immediately with his expertly crafted computer screen film, Host. Shot over 12 weeks on Zoom during the early months of the pandemic, Host focuses on a group of friends who inadvertently rouse a demonic entity during a seance over Zoom. Clocking in at a ruthlessly efficient 56 minutes, Host is a perfect bite-sized genre exercise that, whilst being superficially familiar, so perfectly bottles the specificity of life under COVID. And yet the execution is thrillingly claustrophobic enough that it's a film likely to keep terrifying audiences long after the pandemic is an afterthought in most people's minds. Bride of Frankenstein Though James Whale's original 1931 Frankenstein would certainly fit the bill with its 70-minute runtime, he arguably outdid himself with his ludicrously entertaining 1935 sequel, Bride of Frankenstein. Even if you've never seen the film, you likely know the story through pop culture osmosis at this point. Per its title, A Mate is created for Frankenstein's monster, albeit with a heart-rending outcome. The brilliance of this sequel is that, rather than deign to syrupy sentimentality as its title might suggest, it only uses this potentially kooky setup to deliver an even more brutally devastating statement about the human or inhuman condition. For a film produced in the 1930s, it feels fascinatingly ahead of its time in questioning the utility of marriage while also riffing on more classical themes such as life, death, and loneliness. It crams a whole lot of movie into its mere 75-minute runtime and remains an all-timer sequel regardless of genre almost 90 years later as a result. Tetsuo the Iron Man you have never in your life seen a film quite like this utterly mesmerizing cyberpunk body horror that is known as Tetsuo the Iron Man. Low on budget and time, but high on invention and scorched earth insanity, Tetsuo basically revolves around a businessman who is slowly transformed into a horrific chimera of man and metal. Less a captivating story than a surreal vision you simply can't look away from, this film has the most uniquely grotesque sights to show you, from off-putting sexual imagery to an especially creative, effed-up fusion of human and machine. It's certainly not for everyone, but it's tough not at least to respect the balls-to-the-wall invention on offer throughout all of the 67 minutes of glorious monochrome madness. The Amusement Park George A. Romero's The Amusement Park was originally produced as an educational film about elder abuse and ageism, yet once Romero completed production, the financiers opted to shelve it due to Romero's edgier-than-expected approach. Gee, who could have seen that coming from the guy who gave the world Night of the Living Dead? The 54-minute film, shot over the course of just three days, was largely believed to be lost until a 16mm print was sent to Romero in 2017, shortly before his death. 
and last year, following an extensive 4K restoration process, the amusement park was finally released to the world at large on horror streamer Shudder. This is a genuinely disturbing, socially conscious horror about the perils of aging and society's upsetting disdain for the elderly. Lead actor Lincoln Mazel, who sadly passed away in 2009 at the age of 106 before the film was widely distributed, gives a masterful performance in the role of an aged man being stepped on by pretty much everyone around him. It may not be subtle, but it is genuinely visceral, and a welcome final gem of a film from one of the genre's undeniable masters, Cat People. Val Luton's Cat People remains one of the most distinctive and unforgettable horror films to emerge from the golden age of Hollywood, and truly, the title is a totally accurate summation of what the movie is. A newly married woman, Irina, comes to believe that she's descended from an ancient tribe of people who turn into Black Panthers when sexually aroused. Despite the era of its production forcing director Jacques Turner to rely on implication and innuendo, this is nevertheless a deeply sensual, sexually charged piece of work for its period, using genre trimmings to tap into a fear of intimacy and generational trauma. At just 73 minutes, it is paced like a whip and bleeds atmosphere from every single frame, courtesy of both the lead's seductive performance and Nicholas Musaraka's excellent cinematography. The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari Robert Viner's 1920 German Expressionist masterpiece The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari has such a profound and continued impact upon cinema, and especially the horror genre, that it's basically impossible to list all the filmmakers who owe a debt to it. The story revolves around a deranged hypnotist who uses a somnambulist to commit murders in his name, but what truly still distinguishes this film over 100 years later is its mesmeric visual style. With its angular sets and innovative use of shadow, it's a film that's influenced everything from Nosferatu that was released just two years later to basically every film noir movie ever made. Even those without much patience for silent cinema should give 74 minutes of their life to this film. Because this is such a visually rich meal of a film and the one that still holds up so improbably well today. Freaks. Todd Browning's 1932 horror Freaks is one of the genre's most iconic and infamous offerings, a film one can scarcely believe got made almost an entire century ago considering the boldness of its subject matter and the empathy of its execution. Though the title might suggest Freaks to be a cheap stop and gawk experience, this is actually an at times shockingly powerful film about a group of circus performers who discover that a beautiful trapeze artist is attempting to seduce and murder one of their number for his inheritance. Now, this isn't to say that Browning always toes the line perfectly, and some may see Freaks as an exercise in exploitation no matter its compassionate throughline. but on the balance of its material, it is absolutely a humanistic feat of cinematic representation far ahead of its time. At just 64 minutes, Freaks flies by like an absolute zip, yet even so many years later still harbours an elemental power to shock and surprise, particularly in a climax which would feel envelope-pushing today, yet alone the pre-code era. 